You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Hello, everyone. You're listening to Turtle Island News with Tracy Kennedy. Our news is cosmic today. I have to thank Revolution Radio, once again, Studio A, and I'll be dropping by later to say hi, guys. Um, TurtleIslandNews.info, of course, good morning, brothers and sisters, the Awake Radio Group, and um, Wolf Spirit Radio. I've been telling you about certain cosmic events that are happening right now. If you've listened to me for a while, you'll remember JP and I talked about a certain bow shock that would be hitting us. You know, NASA's AIM spacecraft was sent up there specifically to check out the incoming noctilucent clouds of this year. The one that started in the Arctic Circle, May 19th. I think it is that event triggering the storms and the earthquakes and the mad heat in the Arctic and the strange coldness in the UK. We are breaking climate records all over the world. Last night we had a storm. You wouldn't freaking believe it. I didn't sleep all night watching this thing. Sideways lightning. And it all started with this weird purple haze. Now, I realize that a lot of people are being told that it was because of the three triggered CMEs. These were not major CMEs, and although we did get our first triple shot of that, it was very mild. And as a matter of fact, we won't really be getting hit by it until Thursday morning because it's moving very slowly. What's hitting us right now? is a bow shock wave that I told you about that came from Aries, the constellation, and has been sending out pulses. This pulse didn't start in May, of course. It started in February when the Arctic first got its, um, its first heat wave, which is bizarre. They are breaking temperature records. Temperature records are, as a matter of fact, being broken all over the world. Incredible highs and incredible lows. Earthquakes. Shadowing. Incredible. You know, whether or not... Okay, I need to just slow down and take this piece by piece. You will hear a lot about the events upcoming in September. I've talked to you about this and how the number 21 and the number 23 and this year is mentioned quite a bit. You know the UN and you can look at their manifesto for this year. They're saying over and over again pre-2015 and post-2015. You can go on YouTube and it will show you hundreds of videos of what the Illuminati is planning this year. I've told you about the movies that are hinting at something. You know, first the Russians, then the terrorists, now the asteroids, finally a hostile ET threat. And it may be coming true. NASA is once again preparing to nuke space. Oh yeah. Now you remember the meteor that streaked across the sky and exploded over Russia's Ural Mountains with the power of an atomic bomb. Its sonic blast shattered countless windows, injuring nearly a thousand people. Now this was back February 2013. Many people argued against the claim that it was a meteor. Many witnesses suggested it was a rocket. NASA's later attempt to pull the wool over our eyes by claiming they are preparing for a real-life Armageddon. Their words, not mine. The agency are saying that they are looking 
out ways to launch nuclear bombs into space to defend the Earth from aster, um, asteroids. Aster is probably a better definition. But NASA and the National Nuclear Security Administration, I don't know if they're going to call Bruce Willis in on this one, but have announced, anyway, that they are working together on the possibility of destroying hazardous asteroids using nuclear weapons. Now, this claim coincides with a powerful warning that I've told you about before from a Dr. Kara Rosen back in December 2000. The startling statement by Kara Rosen to the Project Disclosure. Now, this is Stephen Greer, and I know we all kind of go, you're not that guy. But anyway, just take note of the date. And it was well before September 11th and subsequent events that changed our planet mindscape. It deals with a hidden agenda here to weaponize space under the cover of four bogus threats. Specifically, Russian threat, culminating in Star Wars. Keep Star Wars in mind, guys, because I'm going to bring up Star Wars again. A terrorist rogue nation's threat, so son of Star Wars. Followed by an asteroid threat, and then finally, a hostile ET threat. Dr. Rosen met Dr. Warner von Braun in early 1974. Now at the time, Van Braun was dying of cancer, but he assured her that he would live a few more years to tell people about the game being played. That the game was an effort to weaponize space, to control Earth from space and space itself. Everything already points to that. I do not find that out of the question and we know as soon as they found the photonic belt they blew it up and they spent four years massive amounts of money and energy continuing to blow that crap up. Now Van Braun has a history of working with weapon systems. He escaped from Germany to come to the States and became Vice President of Fairchild Industries. What is most interesting, I think anyway, was a repetitive sentence that he said to her over and over and over again like a mantra. During the approximate four years that she had the opportunity to work with him, he said the strategy that was being used to educate the public and the decision makers was to use scare tactics. This is how we identify an enemy. The strategy Van Braun taught her, again, first the Russians are going to be the enemy. And in fact, 1974, they were the enemy, the identified enemy. We were told that they had killer satellites. And probably something to do with eating babies, because that's usually brought in. We were told that they were coming to get us and controlled us, and they were the commies then terrorists would be identified, and that was soon to follow. We heard a lot about terrorism. Then we were going to identify third world countries as all of them crazy. Now we call them nations of concern. But he said that would be the third enemy against whom we would build space-based weapons. The next enemy, asteroids. Now, at this point, he kind of chuckled the first time he said it. Asteroids against asteroids. We're going to build space-based weapons. And the funniest one of them all was what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final scare. And over and over, during the four years that she told him and was giving speeches for him, he would bring up the last card. Remember, Carol, 
the last card is the alien card. We're going to build space babe weapons against aliens. And all of it is a lie. That's what he said. Now, a war on terror planned. Done. In 1977, in a meeting in Fairchild Industries, in a conference room called the War Room, in a room with a lot of charts on the walls with enemies, identified enemies, there were other more obscure names already in 77, like Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi. They were talking about terrorists potential terrorists. No one ever talked about these things before. But it was the next stage after the Russians against whom many were building um, space-based weapons at the time. So she stood up and said, excuse me, why are we talking about potential enemies against whom we are going to build weapons if in fact we know that they are not the enemy. Well, they continued the conversation about who they were going to antagonize, how they were going to antagonize, and at some point, there was going to be a war in the Gulf, a Gulf War. Now, this was in 1977. 77, guys. They were talking about creating a war in the Gulf region when there was $25 billion in space-based weapon program that had yet to be identified. It wasn't called Strategic Defense Initiative, at least not at that time, and not until 83. Now, some people argue that it started in 79, but officially 83. This weapon system had obviously been going on for quite some time. So in 1977, she said, I would like to know why we are talking about space-based weapons against these enemies. No one answered. They just went on and on in the meeting as if she had never said anything. Now, Dr. Carol Rosen on Facebook and her full disclosure as NASA prepares for the real-life Armageddon. Hollywood may have gotten it right after all. NASA and the National Nuclear Security Administration announced that they were working on these things. And like the film Armageddon, Bruce Willis flies a space shuttle to an ongoing asteroid to drill a warhead into its core and nuclear payload could be delivered by a rocket. Often these agencies focus on their own bits and pieces. No one knows the entire puzzle, and it's kept that way for a reason. So anything that brings them together, I guess, would be a good thing. Scientists believe that there are around one million near-Earth asteroids that pose a threat to our planet. Only a tiny fraction have been detected, and the real dangerous ones, although they can snoop into your computer and your cell phone and uh, look at you from a satellite, they can't freaking find these things. And it was dramatically proven, February 15th. This thing that hit the Russian was 20 to 30 times the energy of Hiroshima. That shock, widespread damage, and industries making the largest known natural object to have entered the atmosphere since the 1908 Tagista event, which destroyed an entire forest region of Siberia, and luckily there wasn't much living there at the time. Many people say there is an asteroid with our freaking name on it. A lot of people are pointing to this event coming this year. 
and there is a bus-sized asteroid named 2014 EC. It did come within, I don't know, 38,000 miles of Earth, around a sixth of the distance between the moon and our planet. But it wasn't the only one threatening Earth. There are so many. Apparently the threat is so serious that they've also been saying, you know, it's like playing cosmic roulette. So of course they're going up there to protect us, right? Why would they lie? Well, know that these events, all of them, have been predicted. And a really quick search on my page today, info, will show you the devastation that's happening to our planet. Devastation physically, mentally, and emotionally. Earthquakes, tsunamis, incredible illnesses. 16,000 dead pigs already um, from storms in China, although there are horrific events. And the wheels on the bus are basically falling off. The toxic algae plume that I told you about last week from Mexico to Alaska, strangling our coast. The dead animals, horrific all over the world. And a list and a list and a list goes on of these things. Now, I'm going to try to bring in Barbara Three Crow later because I want to talk about the Rainbow Warriors. But I want to also bring it back to what we've been told by things around the world. This geomagnetic storm is not from the sun. The area of impact at 45 degrees geometric latitude is not again from the sun. It's from something else. It is something ongoing. And the pictures that they're showing you on YouTube are from what I've been telling you about for the last month. We are entering the period of light. It's been called this by just about everyone I've told you about in the last little while. The first peoples of, um, well, I hate to call them the aboriginals, but what they said was 10,000 years ago, men were different and we had our own bridge directly to the stars. I have talked about the bridge of Hermon, Mount Hermon, the jewels in our back. The connection between that and actually 2012 and Area 51. All the peoples of this world told us that we are moving into the galactic cloud. This is confirmed by NASA. We are already here. The Armageddon isn't coming. There are people on our planet dying now. There are civilizations dying now. More and more scientists are stepping up saying, we don't have a hundred years. Now, whether you want to listen to Ashtar Command or any of the others that are usually quoting some sort of native or old scripture, or even, well, the Ashkenazi Jews from Europe, who are all saying, not only is the United States in trouble, and let's look at that for a minute. United States in trouble. Well, your problem is black and white. If you've watched Poltergeist <laughs> at all, you are living on an Indian burial ground. They told you what would happen. Yes, and I've read the conspiracy theories, and you can look all that stuff up about why a young 
a light-skinned man walked into a church and started shooting. You know, if it was the only time that church was attacked, I would say, yeah, false flag. But it was not the first time that church has been under attack. And it's an old one. The problem is people have not dealt with their fear. It is why women are more in danger in their own home, more in danger by being hurt or beaten or raped by someone they know. This too is fear. It is. One of the largest fears, I think, um, which we have as a people, is when we know we have done wrong and we won't deal with it. We won't deal with it. Yes, and I've seen all the conspiracy stuff about it, but the problem in the States is the prejudice. It was built on prejudice, just like every stolen people and stolen land all over the world. We are singing the same story. And it's people who are so beaten down that are always taken to another place to be the killers. That's it. And this is never dealt with. We hate ourselves because of it. We don't know what to do because of it. We get afraid and we curl up in a ball and we forget the fact this happens. This year of light. Called this by too many, too many things that I've mentioned to you over the course of a year. Have been hailing an event that is now here and going to get worse. Before I even look at the US and world events in detail, we have to look at the cycle of man and Earth's experience. Mystical texts from all over the world, historical writings, really, if you can get them, of course, that the Earth will experience a time of radiance, lasting a thousand years or so. Even Hitler's Third Reich and illuminated master race made their long-range plans based on this period of time. Nostradamus, the seer, 500 years past, spoke of this segment of planetary evolution in his quatrains. And it will rain no more, but in 40 years it will be normal. Australian aboriginals know this period of time in the cycle of the change. All of their cultures is based on this ancient knowledge, not only from our planet's past, but from the Earth's orbital connection with all the stars. They all said that we would know when we were in the period of light, and men once again would be different. The Greeks, the Chinese, the Mayans, all great cultures of man, and all cultures of man had an enlightened period when we learned the knowledge. Maybe it was taken, maybe we lost it because of arrogance, but there are no peoples on this planet that have not understood this. There aren't. By any language. The various societies of men claim their foundations as being from and inspired by the in spirit. By beings who at least, if not visited the earth, perhaps are us. A spirit of man birthed in a region of a galaxy. The beings of light, the great and fantastic stories within all of the ancient books, including a list of characters that existed within an influence of a spirit of light. Even if we look at the periodic table and see how it's, see how it's grouped, see how it's put with different colors. These are the ancestors. These are our people and all of our people were great. Don't let them tell you, you weren't. Fear cannot save us now. Hatred will not save us now. And I realize violence has been a tactic that we have been taught. But our time is short. 
and how many movies do we have to watch showing that there would be a big surprise from heaven. This is the story of Atlantis. This is the release of the 200 that were imprisoned. This is the Antichrist Osiris, historically, the legacy of Lucifer, of Azazel, of Zul, of Yah. Yah, who is so horrific, and maybe why some women wear veils, as a matter of fact, not because we were afraid of the angels, but because he was so hideous he could not be looked upon. And it's interesting, you know that movie, 10,000 B.C.? Okay, who called the cops on me? <laughs> yeah, the monster was veiled. The monster was veiled probably because it was so nasty and ugly and dangerous. So when you take an old story, and these stories are old, these stories are very, very ancient, and perhaps the biggest cover-up that we have ever seen. We are in a time when common sense has become quite rare. And the voice of reason, one would think by looking around, it has completely fled mankind. So if you are running the world during these times, and you knew that events on the horizon which would forever change the entire planet, the entire civilization, would you use global mainstream media to tell everyone? If those earth-shattering events were unstoppable, how would you disseminate this information? And would you want to? If your answer is yes, what will the 7 billion plus people reside on planet Earth do the very next day. This is after you tell them that the world is about to go through incredible changes. Will they go to work? Will they continue to support the consumer society? Will many of them even want to get out of bed after hearing what is coming? Therein lies the challenge faced by the shadow world government. Bear in mind, they know exactly what is around the corner. Jade Helm is not an accident. The fact that there's the biggest military drill ever scheduled in the United Kingdom going on the 21st of September, that all of these things are being brought to us at the exact same time. That the hatred on this planet is being pushed at the exact same time. When we look at what Canada has done, when we look at what the United States has done, our leaders, our people of power, when we look at what the UK has done, we must realize that at no time was this done for our freedom. We need to get that. Fukushima alone should have been enough. Where we have a Colorado team die from the plague and that's not enough. To argue with a person who has renounced the use of reason is like administering medicine to the dead. It's too late. I realize that. I do. Way too late. You know, one of my dad's friends told me when I was, I was a little girl, maybe nine, that one day people would be drinking out of bottles. And that goes, what would they be drinking? Water. We laughed so hard because that just seemed outrageous. With our Earth entering a mass extinction level event right now, that if you have a vertebrae, you are in danger. And we can't ignore it. We can't ignore it anymore. Well, we can. We can always ignore it. Ignoring it has worked so well for us. 
And we know Monsanto has supplied the U.S. and Israel with chemical weapons, phosphorus, as recently as 2009. And 10 years after the U.S. has left Iraq, with mass displacement, epidemic, birth defects, cancers, this had not anything to do with freeing those people and Vietnam's horrific legacy, the children of Agent Orange, 40 years after the end of Vietnam, this country, which should be raising back to its feet, cannot because of these sicknesses. So many trees burnt in Canada last year that we took down the oxygen level of the entire planet. We have this transgender explosion. Now, of course, I completely condone anyone loving who they want. But let's be honest here. There is no surgery available to change your gender. You are what you are born as. Men who become transgender and convert into being a woman are still men with all the DNA, all the testosterone, all the body strength that goes with it. And allowing a man to call himself a woman, then be allowed to get in a ring and fight with an actual woman, borders on criminal behavior. And the MMA just did that. Transgender fighter went into a ring with an actual woman and nearly beat her to death. And we watch. And they watch, and they question whether that's okay. Equal rights. Really? Equal rights. I don't care if you want to dress up as a clown. Well, I care a little bit. Don't put the makeup on and come to my house anyway. (laughs) Yes, that's scary. (laughs) Be who you want, love who you want. We obviously need to love each other. Obviously. But, you know, we are fighting for their amusement. And, of course, they want to make it okay. It's because frogs all over the world are transgender now. Fish all over the world are transgender now. Female vertebrates all over the world are now giving birth, self-fertilizing, giving birth. Is this because of its enlightenment? Or is this because the mother knows we are in so much trouble? Our men only have 3% of the original male DNA, the thing that makes them male. And girls have a little bit too. We carry, well, unfortunately girls, we carry some male DNA from every sperm we've ever touched. I know it sounds gross, but if you've touched it, you've not only got it on you, you've got it in you forever. And you pass it to your kids. That's men too. You know, it's true. We have been made in a certain way to do certain things and to carry on no matter what. This planet will be fine. She always is. She's gone through a lot worse than what we've done. Do you think that is why the government has taken over those Walmart? Yeah. Yeah, I think they're getting ready. I think they're officially getting ready. Now bear in mind, they know exactly what is around the corner. Strategically located observatories, high-power telescopes give them access to scientific data and astronomical phenomenon which is so compelling they feel they have no alternative but to distract us deceive us and divert our attention they know there is one thing more than anything else that they 
fear. This is uncontrolled chaos and they know that the real mayhem in the streets would not treat them well. So, spontaneous social pandemonium is the greatest worry and I've told you about the AI guys that is tracking everything you like everything you dislike, everything you look at, everything you do, and a hundred percent can predict our reactions at every given time. That is why Facebook was made. This is Oppenheimer again. The whole Philadelphia experiment was not just about the bomb. It was the information that they they admit they got from the Vedas. Not all of them are happy, happy, joy, joy. How to control, how to predict, and their software is doing it. If you've got Windows 8, and I have it right now. I know, I said a kind of off-the-cheek, a little funny, odd thing about your computer is a sentient being. I'm never 100% kidding and know that they have plan A and plan B and plan C and plan D and they obviously know that something is coming and their time may be up. With this understanding, you can better comprehend the unreasonable and seemingly irrational, mindless, foolish, crazy, insane acts going on right now with the world's government. There are many emerging eventualities over which they have far less influence than what they used to. Their bunkers buried deep underground may not be the protected areas they once thought they were with a methane gas release. Underground is not the happy, happy place. Nor is their off-planet rendezvous sites as safe from solar system calamities as they once believed. Look at the horrific storms on all of the planets. They're happening everywhere now. Of course, their experiments with time travel, interstellar travel, wormholes, parallel universes, which CERN is a big part of all this black slate technology invisibility cloaking have already proved pretty freaking disastrous guys their new super duper fancy UFO looking aircraft that travels supersonic speeds and it blinked in and out they put some guys on the thing and they went crazy we heard one tiny little clip of yes on the astronauts were taken off and um, they're going to be okay. They, what happened to them? This we don't know. But we know that they lost consciousness. <laughs> Whatever that thing does, does not let you come back okay. So before we continue to address the unfoldment of this master devious plan, and how it seems to be cosmically thwarted at every frinkled turn. By the way, CERN is not shut off. It will be running 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the next three years. So many prophecies come into place here when I told you about what they have in that vacuum tube. The 200 who have served them time in hell. We are talking about the Phantom Menace, which surprisingly enough is a real thing. Not just Star Wars. They're called visitors from the twilight. Phantom attackers, phantom travelers. They're called the 200 angels, the fallen, who will return in the fall. Interestingly enough, I'm sure they're going to be a little ticked. At us, I don't think so. Are they us? I don't know. But ancient myths of the cosmic body, 
the destruction myth. This thesis here, this idea, centers on our cosmic body. Not just a being, but perhaps an essence of what we are and what we can once again become. I'm not looking at an asteroid, per se, but a chunk of exploded astral matter from a nearby, perhaps supernova, something like that. When we have been shown over and over again, they're calling asteroids, but there's no big freaking hole caused by a rock after. I'm thinking, that's not a chunk of ice, rock stone, rubble, it's something else. And they actually call it, ancient word, Phaethon. P-H-A-E-T-O-N, closest English translation. So we've talked about the, the morons, the electrons, the neutrons, this is a new one, Phaethon. An ancient mythical name. It occurs from the old accounts of Euphrates, Ovid, um, Hyginus. It was described as the godlike Helios, literally meaning the shining one. They quote quite extensively from ancient legends and ancient mythology. We have talked about the deluge, which is caused by God, Yah specifically, changing places of two stars in a constellation. Persian legend says it was a fiery tiastra, which means the leader of the stars against the planets. Ancient Hindu account of Brahma, once again, and his followers has of noting the arrival in the sky of a very small white body, which within an hour grew to seem as big as an elephant before hitting the earth, causing a worldwide flood. This one's specific. This one's important. This is probably what the idiots up be thought they were going to do with the atom. Something small. The thing, the object. In the vacuum tube will transform when it gets out and it's not just one being. Chinese legends tell how the reign of Emperor Yahoo Yahoo you know that's where you get that from by the way was a bright star that came from Yin constellation. Gotta love the Chinese. They, they at least give you some information with their stories, you know. This I understand. Just before a great planetary upheaval, tribal legends of the Southern California talk of a star-like, sun-like body which transversed the heavens at will scorched the earth when it approached. Ancient Peru, the hero who survived the flood by climbing a mountain, did so by accurately plotting the unusual movements of the sitars, which, which is actually very interesting because it's a sound. We know what a sitar is, right? Although I didn't realize it was a Peruvian word. But the closest translation I got was a sound and a frequency and a vibration. So many traditions refer to two or more visiting bodies. Nordic myths, two heavenly monstrosities, the Midgard serpent and the Fenris wolf acting together brought catastrophe to mythical ancient earth. He's said to have three offshoots 
equally terrible sons of uh, Musfelim. Persian, ancient Persian myth, Earth suffered greatly from two bodies, a harem and the snake-like Azadhira, otherwise known as Zohak and Iblis. Iblis gets later carried on to Muslim religion, Islam. In the Bible, there of course is the heavenly war, Lucifer, usually identified by Christians and the book of Revelation with Satan and Michael and his angels. Lucifer beaten, cast down onto earth to return after serving his time with the host that went with him. Lucifer in chains, said to the abyss. Marduk, Timet, the battle of the planets, Mesopotamian. So, once again, we go back to al Kabulan being Africa. If you look at the astronomy of the Chaldeans, and Sumerians, of course, the Akkadian cylinder seals show seven planets circling the sun. They include the moon as a planet. I think what they're more talking about is consciousness, conscious beings. But we'll get into that. This leaves one planet, though. Unaccounted for. When and how was it lost? We know that the Chaldeans knew of the solar system, like all of our people all over the world, with the sun in its center, and they were not wrong about that and the moon reflecting its light. This is where Islam gets its symbol, sun and the moon. We have this symbol everywhere, the yin and the yang. You'll see this everywhere. And the planets, of course, each to its own dance, its own orbit. Evidence from Sumerian clay tablets in Berlin Museum now suggests that the signs of the zodiac go back at least 12,000 BC, possibly Atlantean times, although I don't think Atlantean times were so far in our distant past, but you know, we've gotten into that before. So you're listening to Turtle Island News, when you get up and stretch your legs a little bit. Welcome back everyone. Thanks for hanging with me and um, hello to everyone, Revolution Radio. The Awake Radio Group, Turtle Island News. Oh, um, Scottish Sovereigns on the Land, People for the People. Well, Spirit Radio, of course. Now, we've spoken before about the work of Carlos Munoz Ferrada, who spoke of her colobus returning. He said this would be invisible. His scientific predictions seem entirely accurate to me. And also he named this year prophecies of this nature, you know, are rarely perfect. However, highly gifted intuitive astronomers, seismologists. What they have told us, sometimes through myth, hoping that eventually someone would be able to translate these things. But pointing to certain events at certain times, he predicted, Carlos predicted, an extraordinary accuracy, numerous earthquakes, in South America during the last century. He did this by making direct correlations between specific astronomical phenomenon and various catastrophic earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Most significant in regards to the future arrival of a great invisible comet planet. 
the Phantom Menace. You can call it the Phantom Menace, but I'm thinking invisible comet planet that is the friggin' Phantom Menace. And whether you believe it or not, what matters is there have been numerous announcements of a specific energy returning to this planet. And I can't ignore it anymore in the face of such pervasive and compelling evidence that something is going on. Something not just us. Something, well, if it was just us, it'd be just here. But every planet is reacting strangely. So let's go back a little bit. In 1998, a book was written called The Red Planet. And uh, V.M. Rebolo describes terrible events that will happen on our planet leading up to an event in 2015. And explains the path that human beings can follow in order to achieve a deep transformation. Hercolibus, this planet, so-called named by sages of antiquity, very different, and various names, approaching our solar system to cause concern for those who know about cosmic events and only see things physically. Apparently, this was an event that put an end to the Atlantean age, the age of our peoples on this planet, that there was a worldwide civilization. You see, when we talk about the New World Order, could we not look at this planet as one civilization now? One peoples. Yes, we have different shades. Yes, we have a little different nation states and provinces and territories and dominions. But we are now at a point where we have one massive group or small group pretty much ruling everything. Is this not every story that I've ever told you about, that we are repeating events? This is why I look at prophecy and try to go all over the world to find similarities. There was a Benjamin um, Solari Paversini, a great Argentinian prophet who was nicknamed South American Nostradamus, who wrote some decades ago, the hour of hours will arrive and its darkness. The class of the big planet will be received. The earth will be reversed. Everything will fall, fall again. This search, we go back to Ur, around 3rd millennium BC, depending on how much they've lied about that timeline. There's a detailed classification of constellations, including an especially interesting name, Enlil. Direct translation, Demon Lord, or again, Phantom Menace. Assyrians refer to him as Bel. He was identified with cosmic hero figure um, Marduk, in turn identified with Phaeton, Phantom, the Phantom Menace, is why I'm getting this, Sumerian mythology, and Lil was thought to be second only to the supreme god, Apsu. However, later he disobeyed divine laws and he was banished where? The underworld. as another rendering of a similar remarkable story of the Lucifer legend, in which a being, originally second only to Yah, was thrown into a bottomless pit, or the phantom legend in which a very similar being, nearly as radiant as Helios, the sun, or the soul, 
was destroyed and his remains cast down from the sky, burnt or buried under the earth. And Lil, it's been argued, is another name for the phantom. Clay tablets around 650 BC found in a library, palace library at Nineveh one of the oldest extant versions of the Akkadian creation myth, which is very similar to Genesis and most creation myths when you pick through our local flavor, flavor of wherever. But it's usually regarded as purely allegorical, portraying an eternal struggle between light and dark. It's also seen as an account of a phantom, a near miss of earth and its results and the wars of heaven there are extremely close parallels in the books that didn't make it to the Bible but for I think the creative force that rules us and somebody still on our side we can get these books now and if it's correct I think the important feature here is an extra planet whether you want to call it Tiamat or not pieces destroyed by Marduk's close approach it's funny because the rotation is called retarded or stopped really by some sort of electrical discharge in a book that um, well a story really that Barb pointed me to, which I may have to buy to read to you, the original story of Electra and her transformation. Two particularly and peculiarly shaped beings in our home neighborhood. There's a passage here of Marduk past the planet Mars which is said to be certain to have certain inexplainable anomalies eccentric orbits extensive fractured by its crust they argue that this could be caused by a similar treatment that meted out Mars as later some sort of thing that inflicted planet Earth and they have those two weird moons Phobos and Deimos fractured points but I guess the other point of this myth is Electra too who left the heavens never to be seen again transformed into something else and the multi-headed serpents and the dragons in the sky few key features here in the depiction of cosmic bodies in all ancient myths from all over the world of all our people generally connected with water and floods and plasma charges and fire serpents and well perhaps the rainbow warriors which might have meant all of us of many colors it might have meant what I saw in my freaking sky last night but these serpents or dragons, often multi-headed, had such attributes of gaping jaws and horns and sparkling crowds and glowing manes and speckled bodies, great jets of fire, clouds of pestilence, poisonous blasts, streams of blood with hissing, roaring, explosive sounds, gigantic, shining, even glowing halos or trails which we are seeing in these descriptions I would argue closely resemble what I think we'd expect from a cosmic body coming close to earth accompanied by other smaller ones some of which have probably hit us and are hitting us now surrounded by blazing methane clouds shooting out burning hydrocarbons, poisonous blasts. Having unlike 
its attendants survived the encounter with Earth, the phantom headed back perhaps towards the sun and confused our memories, which have come down to us, of now a great fiery dragon or a fiery monster shining in the sky heading towards the sun just after the great flood. Survivors might have seen glimpses of it in rare glaps of the clouds during the rapid onset of the dark age following the cat catastrophe that made our skies dark. Those who saw all or some of these events and survived would never have forgotten those and most likely would have recorded them in some dot and ring marks that appear such as the there's one in western Scotland I'm trying to remember the name Ardmamach I think rings dots but we know that heavenly objects and stellar alignments frequently feature in all of our megalithic structures and carvings, Stonehenge, um, Kalanish, it would therefore be surprising if such cosmic events and shattering events at even so distant a date would have went unrecorded by our ancestors. One thing we know for certain it did not go unrecorded on a column in the Egyptian College of Priests at Sais. For there the name Phantom or Phathion was carved in hieroglyphics and read out together with the story of Atlantis. This name was specifically mentioned by Egyptian priests, Tibetan priests, before their names got changed, of course, who gave the original account of Atlantis as a myth, whose real meaning was some sort of disturbance, planetary bodies, causing a change here. Atlantis destroyed, they said, in such a disaster, and fearsome worldwide bombardments, near destruction of life on planet Earth, it has happened. And some sort of confrontation. When we talk about the Phantom or the Kingu, the attendants and the smaller bodies that are always around them, ancient descriptions of them, especially well done and kept, thank God, in Persia, Say an ominous group of bodies in the sky, constantly changing shape. For example, sometimes resembling a human shape, sometimes a golden horned bull, sometimes a horse. The changing could be change in angles too, which these objects were seen as they approached Earth and wobbled and shifted on its axis. They may have been coming at one traje trajectory, we may have been moving, but the evidence for magnetic charges still detectable in all the igneous rocks of this period, which apparently between 10 and 100 times stronger than anything that could have been caused unaided. Well, it can't be done by earth movements alone, put it that way. Kingu, separated from phantom and the earth's spin, apparently stopped, which caused problems here, in particular the water, the world's rivers, the original four. They're saying right now there are two main rivers on this planet that feed everything. Well, two on the surface, two underneath, that feed everything, that all waters come from these two. But in particular, anyway, all lakes, all rivers, all oceans, 
one time removed from their no more home, concentrated close as the area to these cosmic bodies, causing gigantic tidal waves, floods, and as Earth's rotation slowed, terrifying winds blew, which bodily transported whole masses of loose, huge rocks and surface materials, enormous distances, flattened entire forests, wiped out vast volumes of water to great heights. This we see in a lot of the deserts that don't look like they have been deserts for long. It looks like they got dumped on. So meanwhile, the flows of semi-liquid volcanic magma always pulled towards this local phantom group created a number of new mountain ranges, enormous fractures, um, buckling of tectonic plates, vast rivers of molten lava flowed, and shifting clouds of dust and gas spread worldwide. This we have proof of. Amongst these ranges, the newer ones, the Andes, on which could have occurred the ancient precursor to the great stone city of Tiawak um, Khan pushed up about 13,500 feet by this cataclysm. In some places, clouds, volcanic gas, carried large stones for miles, making marks on the surface of rocks, often caused and confused by experts, as happening because of glaciers along high-pressure steam full of grit. These carved out hold valleys, rock surfaces, hot mud, voluminous torrents, cascaded down hillsides, taking great boulders with it, and countless creatures trapped underground in useless refuge. Animals, humans, plants on the surface that had no trance, and the moon changed to its present orbit. We go to the Slav mythology. There is a star or a planet called Godahar or the wolf progeny, which disturbed the moon in ancient times, causing great cataclysms. Probably the exact same time, exact same phenomenon. And a smaller body called Kinji, they have the same word, became trapped by Earth now began to break up. Liquid and frozen fluids from this would initially have cascaded down to us vast sheets of water and hail, as in Noah's flood story again. The great final explosion of Kingo must have caused a deadly blast. The largest fragments what the Norse sagas called the sons of Moose Pelheim, probably butchered that, but it's close anyway, would have inflicted great craters on this planet. Some of these may be the ones recently discovered, subtly hidden, in the contours of the great masses of northern Canada. Following this would have been some fearsome worldwide bombardments of rock iron pieces and the like, sheets of sand and dust, blazing fluids, sticky liquids, probably followed. The craters of South Carolina would have been caused at this time together with similar craters or bays in Holland. I believe that a series of lakes all aligned from north West and southeast are basins formed by impacts in a distant time. So the main cosmic body, the phantom, escaped towards the sun, leaving Kingu to finish its, its disintegration over Earth. With the moon in a new orbit, the Earth on a radically different axle tilt, Chaos here. Piled up tides of water, magma returned to their normal homes, causing 
colossal tidal waves, searing gales, making our present day hurricanes and typhoon look like, you know, a little gentle spring gust. And countless stories from mythology described events like this. Irreversible power, awesome height. They only, or they submerged not only valleys, but hills and slopes of mountains. Being stopped by the highest mountain ranges, collapsed parts of the Earth's crust and became new ocean basins. All organic matter in the path destroyed, or most of it, or gathered up and deposited chaotically in all directions, a massive biological extinction. Human beings, the lucky, perhaps unlucky ones who survived, were witness to something which humanity as a whole has never, probably never suffered to this degree before or since. All over the world, they have times where it said the earth nearly died. And there's a great amount of plentiful evidence of this. And why perhaps we can't find our ancient peoples. They never disappeared. Some may have flown off. But it combines scientific myth logical evidence here, I think. And to me it leaves little doubt of the very existence of this worldwide civilization and how it was threatened and how we are reliving the same thing that happened to our forefathers. Maybe exactly. Maybe right down to we use technology and open the door we freaking shouldn't. When we look back to the red planet, Colobus, in the times of the end, that it would once again approach the Earth. Due to its great magnetic power, he said it would destabilize the Earth's crust, causing earthquakes, tidal waves, volcanic eruptions, natural disasters. It would have approached our solar system in former occasions, unleashed cataclysms, wiped out the Atlantean civilization. Lemuria, too, if you like, if you're a follower of that. So it would come again, the end of our civilization, but allow a new era to begin. This is the final prophecy told by just about everyone in different ways. The Vatican, advanced telescope, part of Mount Graham International Observatory, situated on Mount Graham, southwest Arizona, operated by the Vatican Observatory, absolutely fought against by the natives who live there because this mountain is important and they too call this mountain a bridge to heaven. As if we may have used this as another escape route. Same story, different world. But the Vatican it should be known as one of the largest and oldest research institutes in the world. Why else do you think the Vatican owns an observatory outside of Arizona? Safford. Not only does the Vatican operate advanced technology at Mount Graham, they share the same facility with the large binocular telescope observatory. Heinrich Hertz began operation in 1993, again with a large binocular telescope. One of the world's largest and most powerful telescopes began operating using mirrors independently. 
2004. Joint operations between two mirrors began 2008, and the Vatican Secret Archives probably has more volumes of the original documents in the form of scriptural treaties, as well as historical records produced by the ancients, the ones they didn't burn, than any other laboratory or library on this earth. The Church is further informed about the future of humanity from numerous apparitions, because that's what they call them, which have occurred around the world, especially over the last 200 years. It is well known, in fact, in certain circles, that many of the prophecies which were given to children have never been released by the church because of their dire content. Why might this be the case? Because the controllers of information do not want such doses of reality. It's simply too much for the masses to bear. Of course, they have deliberately leaked this and that information over the decades. So those who do have ears will receive the message. Because even they said they cannot stop the ones who will be called. The Vatican is also well aware of St. Malachi's prophecy regarding the last ten popes, as well as similar revelations from various apparitions. The precursors of the Phantom Menace, maybe. But by those accounts, and others, like Nostradamus, the ones we've heard, that this pope will be the final Roman pontiff. He has even said that he doesn't think he has any more than two years to live. First he said four last year and said, no, I don't have that long. But one of these presents actual context of when the current Pope will be forced to flee Rome in December when the great comet is seen in the daytime. One of the latest and most famous series of Martian, believe it or not, prophecy clearly indicates huge changes are coming to Earth. Whenever these predictions veer into Earth, change territory, they are always, they always speak of massive, unpredicted, catastrophic events overtaking the entire planet at the same time. It's why the whole world experiencing the same thing. There is no calm place. No location is spared. Except for the few preordained safe havens for a protected portion of humanity that is to be safeguarded. And believe me, they're already there. They were called the Martian Apparitions at Garabando. And I can give you that link. You can find it on YouTube too. G-A-R-A-B-A-N-D-A-L. That brought prophecy in similar language, but a warning to all of humanity. As well as a chastisement that would humble every human being. So of many other lesser known appearances of the Blessed Virgin Mary, such as those known as the Bayside Prophecies, and even the third secret of Fatima, which is certain about end times, which is why the Vatican will never let you read that. The last Pope put his, oh, hell no, stamp on it. But the primary agent of such massive global change, usually referred to as the shift or the bow shock, depending on how scientific. It's specifically about an axis pole shift, where the Earth actually shifts on its axis by a number of degrees. 
In her book, Mary's Message to the World, Annie Kirkwood makes it clear Mary speaks about the turning of the earth, and the turning is used quite a bit, as if it's a dance, like Shiva. Historical record, both geological and others, of course, it's replete with hard evidence of periodic platic planetary cataclysm. Our blue orb has, in fact, experienced global mass rearrangements at closing of eras and conclusion of epochs since ever. We, in the Demu Duma of um, the Kali Yuga, the Age of Conflict, we are in the Iron Age, and it is certain that Mother Earth will once again turn so that the old lands will be rejuvenated, refreshed. But this is always a necessity so that new lands can emerge to sustain a new race of humanity. It's likewise essential. It is a byproduct of these things. $64,000 question, I guess, is what kind of celestial event will it be? Is this what they are looking towards? Bearing some invisible form of Deus Ex Machina to produce such an outcome, only a celestial intruder of great mag magnitude would possess the right stuff to cause the earth to literally roll over and stay there as the new normal. Hence we see more weight than ever afforded to the various schools that promote Planet X and the return of the fathers, the destroyers, the nemesis, Marduk, Neribu, Wormwood, Tenth Planet, Red Planet, Destroyer, Techi, Red Star Kachina. Somebody even called it Bernard the First. I don't know why it got that name Bernard, but, you know, I heard this planet called Bob. Bob's fine. All of these names have been preferred as candidates for the heavenly body that may be responsible for the next shift here. It's true that the sun is going through some major changes. I wonder the new location in the galaxy vis-a-vis -vis galactic center is enough to bring about profound fundamental transformation. But I am seeing rainbow lights, guys. But all of the other galactic happenings, seen and unseen, triggering events and sustaining soul's new behavior. The sun ages. It's quite possible that it is simply entering a new phase of existence, not unlike a teenager growing into a young adult. However, there does exist an overwhelming body of evidence which points directly to overwhelming influence of something sizable would explain why many of the recent and radical changes undergone by the other external planets here, especially one with immense gravitational field would be required for any kind of change or pole shift. As it's often been foretold. But the other thing is what we have seen, which is weird lately, is we're seeing a sign of intelligence. A heavenly body, possibly as large as the giant planet Jupiter. 
probably so close to Earth that it would be part of the solar system, has been found. In the direction of the constellation Orion, by the orbiting satellite aboard the U.S. Infrared Astronomo Astronomical Satellite. Infrared, so it is invisible. It is the unseen one. So mysterious is the object that astronomers don't know what it is. If it's a planet, if it's a comet, a nearby protostar. Never got hot enough to become a star, a distant galaxy so young that is still in process of forming its other stars. All you all they can tell us is that they don't know what it is. Another noted astronomer, Dr. Robert H. Harrington, convinced existence of Planet X because of perpetrations in which his field had observed both Neptune and Uranus and they found all kinds of things out there. Whether or not this is a physical being or an entity, scientists have noticed Uranus isn't following its predicted orbit. They blame anomalies, as yet unseen. Neptune, discovered in 1846, astronomers are using the same strategy to explain the quirks of the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, and they still can't do it. An unseen companion, a dark star, gravitationally bound to something, but the weird part is, apparently, it moves, then they move. The tenth planet, does our sun have a dark companion? Is the dark companion a planet, per se? You know, there's a cop circle telling us perhaps of the approaching celestial body. And I'll send you a picture of it. We have had meteoric changes throughout the solar system. And the planets, all of them, have been experiencing unparalleled dramatic transformation. Never seen, never recorded before. They are undergoing variations in their atmosphere. Example, the Martian atmosphere is getting sizably thicker. The Earth's moon is growing in atmosphere. There is about 600 kilometer deep layer of natrium, which wasn't there before. It just friggin' appeared. Like magic. N-A-T-R-I-U-M. Dr. Dimit Alexei Dimitri says that we're having this kind of change in the upper levels of Earth's atmosphere where HO gas is forming that was never there before. It's just forming. It simply does not exist in the quantity that it does now. It did not. They don't know why. It has nothing to do with global warming, global cooling, global anything. It's not related to CFCs. It is not fluorocarbon emissions. It is not... I don't know, because we're bad, mean people. None of that stuff. It's just showing up. Magnetic fields, brightness of planets, changing. The planets are experiencing a sizable increase in their overall luminosity. This is the year of light. Venus is showing us marked Elevations in its overall brightness. Jupiter has such a highly magnetic charge now that there is actually a visible tube of ionizing radiation that is formed between it and its moon. 
you can actually see the luminous energy tube in photographs that have been taken recently. In addition, the magnetic field strength of each planet has increased. Uranus and Neptune appear to have recent pole shifts. Voyager 2, when it flew past Uranus and Neptune, the apparent north and south magnetic poles were slightly offset from the rotational pole. It was in one case, it was 50 degrees off. The other case, difference was around 40 degrees, which is, is a pretty big deal, you know? The overall changes could be especially, essentially be broken down into three categories. Energy field changes, luminosity changes, atmospheric changes. Our climate is changing rapidly, intensely changing everywhere. Heat waves, droughts, heat flow from Earth's mat mantle contributing to Greenland melting, North Pole moving small lake and melted and appeared in 2013 a new lake at the top of the world wherever radar shows a giant storm of dust sometimes it's just bugs because they're acting weird too winter storm Nemo do you remember that historic build blizzard that pounded New England monster Oklahoma Tornadoes, El Nino tornado, super rare, national record breakers, but records are breaking worldwide now. Power outages, water restrictions, soaring heat, extreme weather, growing in frequency and intensity everywhere. Stunning photographs of monster storms everywhere. Places that haven't got them. Worldwide weather patterns have gone into a crash and burn mode. Literally, figuratively, each region of the world is now experiencing a periodic profound departure from whatever traditional weather norm have since weather has been kept. Global climate change doesn't accurately describe what the planet is going through. Ongoing worldwide atmospheric apocalypse does. Manifesting localized climate cataclysms does. Global warming? No. Global cooling? No. But cosmic rays are now happening everywhere. I mean positive lightning is intensifying. This is cosmic rays. Now, arc lightning causing massive explosions and earthquakes and destructions worldwide. Positive lightning strikes, which used to be rare, are rare no longer. It's critical to understand the physical nature and behavior through the lens electric universe as well as plasma cosmology here. Plasma ionized gases which make up 99.999 percent the visible universe which we are made up of too. This is no longer theory. We can only assume that this particular heavenly body being or not if it can change the planets, it is changing you. You are an electrical being. Even the esoteric, hyperdimensional physics, which they got from the Vedic, so it is not new, it is old. And we knew this. Know that our people were never 
stupid. As much as they want us to believe that we just recently got out of the caves and started scratching ourselves and that we've always been at war and we've always hated each other, this cannot be more false. But we've talked about how quickly ideas can be changed, right? They can. And unfortunately what's going on it's about 500 years of utter devastation worldwide. We've attacked each other. It's all they teach now in schools. Who attacked who first? Whose fault it is? And it's always not your fault. Can we stop this? Don't know. But know that there's two sides to every story. Everything in duality, whether it's good or bad for you, has to do with how you deal with it, how you engage with it. I'm sure some of the, some of the people who have seen perhaps our ancestors, perhaps us in the future coming back to help, we know for a fact that quantum physics came from the Vedic influence. Determined the development of all the theories that we go on now. I'm not interested in New Age mumbo jumbo. I'm interested in understanding what is real and what is false. This is why the great minds of our time have consulted the Vedic text. The famous Danish physicist, Nobel Prize winner, when winning a Nobel Prize actually meant something. Laureate Niels Bohr, follower of the Vedas, he said, I go into the Upanishads to ask questions. The founders of quantum physics, avid readers of the Vedic text. Erwin Schroeder, Australian Irish physicist, also Nobel Prize winner, came up with his famous wave equation that predicts how the quantum mechanical wave functions change with time. He said this was directly from the Vedic text. That we saved any of our books that we could actually get a handle on and read is a friggin' miracle. And to me it shows that we're not here alone or working alone. Some things must come back. The subatomic particle Again, Vedic texts, sizes, devices, even how our retina works, the thing that we call vision, all of these things, Vedic texts, quantum theory, didn't look ridiculous to people who have read Vedic texts. It is Vedic thought. And it is a thought that from images and stories, which may seem fanciful, but if we are children of Abraham, that's Brahma. We'll continue with this on Thursday, and I'm hoping to get Barbara in because I want to talk about the rainbows. Thanks for hanging with me, everybody. I really appreciate it. And talk to you soon. Bye for now.